Welcome to Health Activators with lifestyle medicine doctor, GP and longevity expert, Dr. Alka Patel. This show will help you to discover a hidden health hacking code that unlocks your phenomenal potential for an outstanding health span, lifespan and wealth span. The show features candid conversations with celebrities, influencers and industry icons, real life stories and cutting edge health activating advice that other doctors might not tell you. Discover why now is the time to join the strategic self-care revolution and experience the profound effects this will have on your personal and professional success. Now, here is your host, Dr. Alka Patel. Hi, hey, and hello, health activators. On today's show, I have with me Eamon Chowdhury. Now, Eamon might be a familiar face to you because in 2021, him and his nephew, well, they captured our hearts when they took part in that popular BBC TV series, Race Across the World, and they were crowned winners of the show. If you haven't seen it, this is a competition where in this particular series, teams of two had to cover a distance of 25,000 kilometers to get from Mexico City to Ushaya in Argentina on just 26 pounds a day. 26 pounds a day to eat, drink and live off. It's gripping stuff. So if you haven't watched it, go and watch it. And Eamon, well, he's also an avid charity supporter and he's a Pride of Britain award winner. Also a nine time marathon runner. Before we get into today's show, please do support today's show partner, Youth and Earth. Youth and Earth have a range of products that I love to use myself to supercharge my metabolism, to support my health and to slow down cellular aging. Just be sure you click the link in the show notes for exclusive offers which Youth and Earth are so generously giving for listeners of this show. Iman, welcome, welcome to the show. I am super, super excited to speak to you. Lots and lots of reasons. But firstly, uh, well, really, because I can now talk one marathon runner to another. Yeah. Oh, oh, <laughs> congratulations. Oh, you too, because I know you recently ran the London Marathon. Me too, yes. But I, of course, unlike me, this most certainly wasn't your first marathon, was it? So I know that two weeks prior, you've run the Manchester Marathon, and I want to talk about that and the sort of circumstances in which you ran that as well. And you've been doing some immense running challenges as well these last few years. So I wanted to really kick off uh, kick off with that, with running, uh, Iman. Tell me, tell me about running and what running does give you personally first of all what does running give you personally um in a nutshell for me running is about my community it's about um you know meeting new people meeting new faces and to be quite honest with you i've never been a runner and yeah. I, pro I probably never will be a runner to be honest 26.2 miles is a, it's a it's a long way it's a big, big distance do you know what i mean oh. so uh, <laughs> i think it, I, I i love the the whole camaraderie of you know, the build up to the race, you know, going on um, runs with your like, friends and family, and the the whole hype after the race as well. Uh, you know, after you finish it, the sense of uh, accomplishment, uh, all the high fives, and the actual run itself is it's quite hard. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that is so true. There's a real sort of honesty to that, isn't there? There's, I think that I've, I've met several people and, and some of it, it's the other way around. Yeah. It's the, the training is hard. Mm -hmm. The practice is hard. The getting into shape is hard. But the run itself with all the crowds and the camaraderie, you kind of find yourself pushed through because there is a lot to it, isn't there? But you kind of kind of do you have the running bug? Because you even though you're not defining yourself as a runner, you are doing an awful lot of running. I am. Yes, um, I, 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 I'd say I do have the running bug. Um, um, I, it, it only came to me during uh, lockdown, um, and that's when I found out about park run. I started mm. attending, you know, just a five k park run, and then I just creeped up to a ten k, and then I just thought, you know, how hard can a marathon be? And I was fortunate because um, BBC offered me a, a place to do the London Marathon about three years ago. And then said, oh, do you fancy doing it? I was like, I've never done one before. I think that, that, that was my first marathon. Well, that was my first, my second marathon. But um, I hadn't done a marathon for like 10, 12 years. 
So I, I thought to myself, you know, how hard can it be to get back into shape? And I did zero training for it. I literally, I got I got offered it, uh, I think, about four weeks prior to the actual marathon day itself. So I had no training whatsoever. And uh, I did it and I loved it. And I, pro- I really loved it. And, uh, and I've been back ever since. And uh, I've done, I think, nine altogether now. So nine marathons and you call yourself not yeah. a runner i think we need to change that definition right <laughs> you are a runner yeah. iman you are a runner <laughs> i'm not sure I'll, uh, y- yes and no yes and no and do, what is i i don't do it for a time do you know, i don't really mm. look at my time i think my, my pb was 409 and that was my first marathon that i did and i've never got close to it ever uh, so I don't really, you know, judge it by time. I just want, it's more about accomplishments one by one. Yeah, I'm totally with you there. I think, again, you know, people fall into two kind of baskets with it, don't they? There are those that are running for time and that's the measure and that's the accomplishment. And I think that's that's amazing. And then me and you are very alike in that is it's not about the time. It's about that achievement yeah. and that experience and everything you get from that running experience itself, which is in a way it's beyond words as well, isn't it? Because there's so much going on. There's so much in the body itself, let alone the people um, around you. And it just fascinated me the way that the crowds oh, just yeah. turned up and this way that, you know, human beings just want to be there for each other. And it sounds like you said this is this gives you a sense of community. So that sounds like it's something that's very important to you. It is 100 percent. I think uh, without the crowds there, without the uh, people supporting you, I think it'll be a completely different uh, race. Um and you know for yourself the the crowds in london were just incredible considering it was like chucking it down pretty much the whole day uh, you know yes. we still had thousands and thousands you know lining the streets um you know when you're running through and people shouting your name egging you on it's just it's something else do you know what i mean it's just that it's that sense and that's well, that's one of the main reasons that i keep going back to 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 do marathons and to keep doing races it's just for that um yeah. you know that sense of I guess it's a sense of belonging, almost mm. like you're sort of taken in by the the, the whole the whole atmosphere. Uh, and uh, you know, I've done London three times, but uh, the one uh, the one that I did last last week that was by far the the best. Um, I just found it just incredible. The last two have been good, but um, yeah, Sundays was very special. Oh, it was just out of this world wasn't it spectacular like you say even though the weather wasn't on our side the rain was coming down it just it almost added mm. to that atmosphere as well that you know there's nothing going to stop stop us all and everybody was cheering even louder than i imagine ever before because of that because that that sense of we've just got to push everybody everybody along did you get your runners high because i certainly got it coming down the embankment that kind of last stretch and the crowds there were just incredible and you had this whole road to yourself and all of those iconic landmarks ahead with with Big Ben. That, for me, was an incredible yeah. kind of highlight for me. What about you? What was your highlight? Um, I think my highlight probably was... Big Ben was special, wasn't it? Big Ben was special. Uh, coming down the, the magma, like you said, that was good. Uh, but I think Tower Bridge, you know, because you know, uh, you know you're know, halfway yes. there. You know what I mean? It's a sense of accomplishment. As soon as you come over the bridge, you know you're halfway there. And you see the other runners coming the other way. And uh, <laughs> yeah. you've not, not got far to go now. So uh, I think going over Tower Bridge and, and the crowds on Tower Bridge was incredible. Yeah. Uh, like, there's a lot of like shouting, a lot of, and that's where our, our charity was as well. So right. meeting all them guys there. Uh, so I'll say, yeah, Tower Bridge was my oh. probably my hi- highlight. So, yeah, Tower Bridge has always been my highlight, Love and it. Um, and also the the last when you see the signs for six hundred meters and two hundred yeah. meters, that was yeah. that was special because you, you you see the crowds on your left and right, and everyone's just cheering you on, and you think you know I'm I'm there, I've I've done it. I've done the sense that I can't believe I've done it, right? And you can't believe that you've just done 26.2 miles. So incredible. And you mentioned charity just there. So um, tell me about your charity work, because, again, I know that this is something very, very close to your heart. So at the moment, where's your where's your heart with your charity work? Uh, my heart is with like a lot of charities. I do a lot of things for different charities. But for this year, um, I got I got in touch. Uh, well, they got in touch with me. It was their MND Association. Uh, and about the work that they do, uh, I was fortunate of, uh, fortunate enough to have uh, gone to quite a lot of their meetings uh, in and around our area. Uh, and I met uh, Rob Burrow, who was uh, diagnosed with um, 
M and D uh, a year and a half ago, and we became like friends. Um, I'm learning about the learning about the actual disease itself. You know, it, before that, I didn't know nothing about it, and when I learned about it, and I figured out for myself. You know, with the effects of it. Uh, don't get me wrong; it, it affects an individual a lot, but it's not just the individual that gets affected. It's the family unity as well, um, and that's what took me back because you know, the person that gets diagnosed with it, uh, the whole family almost get diagnosed with it because they have to obviously look after the loved ones, uh, and it's like a twenty-four hour, uh, you know, yeah. session, and uh, and that really took me back. So I, you know, I, I thought to myself, you know, if I didn't know nothing about MND until 18 months ago you know there must be thousands or hundreds of thousands of people out there that don't know nothing about it so uh, you know i made my challenge to me to raise awareness and try try raise some money for them and uh, yeah it's mainly awareness uh, uh, and, and that's hopefully that's what i'm doing because i've i've i've, I've chatted about it to a lot of like uh, journalists and on the radio and stuff like that about mnd or how important it is and um and also i think coronation street i've recently just um Put a, a little story about MND as well. I think one of the uh, characters got diagnosed with it, so I think that's great for the for, for the charity as well. Yeah, yeah. So just for everyone listening, MND motor yeah. neurone disease, uh, which is a, a condition that, as it says in the name, affects your neurons that affect your movement, your motor function, mm. um, and it's very progressive over time. So that it starts with hands and feet, but really starts to affect yeah. the motor function of breathing and, and speaking and eating. And I'm I'm so glad you kind of raised the part about families because sometimes that sense gets forgotten. It does. Well, everybody coming together to really take care and support and raising awareness is, is such an important thing to do because it changes lives and it's not just changing one life it's changing changing many lives so no really appreciate that you you're, you're yeah. doing this and raising that awareness in such a big way as well but it was so striking wasn't it on on the run during the marathons and you'll have seen this time and time again but everybody running for a purpose yeah all those purposes are were all related to to health ultimately and i yeah. think for me what was so striking was that ultimately health is the foundation of of everything and and people supporting each other's health and they have a story about health and about challenges to tell as well and and it's incredible because behind every t-shirt that t-shirt you're wearing for MND is yeah. a whole lot of narratives about people's lives and people's stories so super super appreciate you you doing that and being able to do that at big scale as you say kind of getting that that message out um loud and clear as well so yeah. and you've done lots of other charity work as well haven't you take us back to race across Britain or race uh, race across the world because that yeah. was an incredible time for you as well so tell us a little bit about that it was I think uh, being on that show uh, on the BBC on the race across the world was uh, a life-changing experience for myself um, I always say this phrase um, you can't once you see something you can't unsee it if you know if, if you know what I mean um, because we travel from Mexico City to Ushuaia uh, and we travel the whole of South America. So we went through a lot of like poverty stricken countries that have been hurt by war and, you know, um, government and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. um, we came across these street children in Sao Paulo uh, in Brazil. And for me, that was a turning point for our race. Uh, so when we came across these kids, um, there was a sleeping roof, they had nothing. And at the time, you know, I didn't have I didn't have anything on me, so I gave them what I could in terms of like clothing, food, whatever I had, and I made a promise to them, you know, either way, if I win this show or not, I will come back and help you. And after that happened, it was always on my mind, even like in the racing, uh, like you know, how can I help these kids? Yeah. Um. So obviously, I, we finished the race. Uh, we were fortunate to have won the race as well. Uh, so me and my nephew, we decided to donate the money uh, that we won uh, to helping them kids. Uh, so that's what we did. So we, we gave all the money away because twenty thousand pounds in, on the grand scheme of things, you know, it's you know, don't get me wrong, it's a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money. Do you know what I mean? It's you know what you do buy a new car with it. That's about it, really. A second hand car, even that. But twenty grand in in Brazil goes a huge way. Do you know what I mean? It saves so many lives. It's changed so many lives. And um, so, so I, came, I came back to the UK and then I stayed in touch with uh, some couple of charities that I met over there and uh, I was looking at ways on supporting them and helping them. So that's when I started doing running challenges or different types of challenges um, in raising money and awareness for, for these causes. So then 
Um, I got in touch with another charity who offered me to build in a school, uh, a school for orphans in Nepal. Wow. Said right, we need X amount of money to build it. Uh, so there was a hundred hundred thousand pound challenge basically. So I started that two years ago. So I, I started fundraising. I did loads of challenges. Uh, used my profile on social media to to raise money as much as I could and uh, hit the hundred grand mark. And uh, wow. the school is getting built at the moment. So hopefully within the next couple of months it should be built. And I'll go over to Nepal to uh, to check it all out. Um, and then, then I came across loads of like UK charities that needed help and awareness. Epilepsy was one of them. You know, it it, it needed an incident to happen to myself to realise what's going on. You know, somebody I was in the shopping uh, shopping mall in in where I live, and um, in front of my wife, my child. You know, somebody started happening had an epilepsy happen to have an epileptic fit right in front of us. And I was just in shock. I just didn't know what to do. Uh, I didn't know much about it. So, yeah. like, the, like, like a, a crowd started forming around this person, and nobody knew what to do. So, uh, unfortunately, there was a, like a paramedic there, um, and he sort of came and helped around. So, mm. so um, you know, when I came home, I, I, it was on my mind, and I, I, th- I thought I'll find look into epilep- epilepsy, and then I found the charity which was quite close to me. So I got in touch with them, and then I said, "Listen, what can I do?" And they said, "You know, for us, it's obviously raising money is great, but it's more of the awareness." Yeah. So I got into raising awareness and money for uh, epilepsy. Uh, epilepsy action it was, and um, yeah, so I did what I could with them, and then. Mm. Um, uh, then I came across the MND, uh, and then hopefully I'm doing as much for them as well. So wow. yeah. Gosh, there's something incredibly striking when you're talking about this, Iman, in terms yeah. of I think this sort of uniqueness of you, because in that whole crowd of people around this person who was having the epileptic fit, did everyone go home and go away and do what you did? There's something that seems very innately giving yeah about you and responsive is that always been the case can you does that come from childhood or yeah. where that comes from i think it stemmed from my childhood um my late father always you know said to us you know yeah we should always look after each other no matter who who they are even if it's your brother your sister if it's a complete stranger it doesn't really matter uh, at the end of the day you know we're all human beings you know our family holidays was um going back to Bangladesh where my parents are from and uh, my, my dad opened a, an orphanage there about 40 years ago and um, you know, we'd go back to the village but we wouldn't stay in a hotel, we wouldn't actually stay in our village, we'd actually stay at the orphanage so he, he made sure me and my siblings all stayed with the other kids at the orphanage to, to see what it's like mm. uh, and that's what we did and every single year, summer we'd go back for six weeks and we'd stay at the orphanage, we'd get to know the kids, learn with them, play with them and sort of grow up with them. Um, and you know, fortunately, you now since I've become an adult, you know, a lot of these kids that I've been brought up with at the orphanage, you know, they've gone on to do you know different types of jobs and you know, you know, different careers. Uh, but they were given the opportunity; otherwise, they wouldn't have had it, yeah. it, gone to the orphanage. And I remember, uh, you know, all throughout throughout my my time at the orphanages, you know, I've I've come across a lot of stories where you know, you know, it, it's heartbreaking. Um, you know, but the, at the end of the day, you know, in my six weeks, my six week holiday would be up and I'd, I'd know I'd go back to UK, back to my you know, normal life, so to speak. Yeah. But, you know, what is normal? You know, I've left these guys behind, you know, to come back to the UK, to go to my uh, school or, mm. or or whatever and go back to my normal life. But, you know, it'd be always in the back of my, my mind that I've left all these guys behind and, you know, I'm hoping that I'll go back next year and they'll still be there. It's incredibly humbling, isn't it? What do you think your your father would say if he saw you having done all this work for the orphanage that you have and carrying yeah. those memories of your childhood with you? What would he say? I, I should imagine he would be happy. Uh, you know, he this uh, I, I was like him uh, um, uh, at his age. Uh, do you know what I mean? Um, you know, everything that he had, he'd give away. He'd, he'd, he'd like literally have, you know, the clothes that he had and that was about it really and he would just go out and help others and that was the beauty of my dad and he taught that to myself and all my siblings uh, you know what I mean like possessions and stuff like that they sort of don't really matter in the grand scheme of things 
and you've got a little daughter, haven't you? What do you think? What do you think we should be teaching our children? I think the the beauty of uh, like t uh, passing your ideas and over to your ch children is we can sort of stem to what they, we want them to believe and what we want them to become. And for me, uh, my daughter is all about humanity, being being kind. Um, you know what I mean? I've I've come across kindness throughout my whole life. People that have helped me. Um, and I can only repay that back in kindness. Um, you know, but when I was on race across the world, um, you know, people were helping us. You know, what I mean, complete strangers that were letting letting, letting letting me and my nephew stay at their houses. You know, without no money, they will feed us. Uh, you know, because we didn't have enough money to to feed ourselves at some stages, so they like give us sandwiches and stuff like that. And you know. When when you sort of take them back, when everything's stripped away from you, your phone, your wallet, everything's taken back, you sort of, you know, value the uh, importance of kindness and the importance of humanity. Um, and that's what Race Across the World taught me. Uh, because, you know, before that, you know, I've, I've never been in that situation when uh, I've not had my wallet, I've not had any money, I've not had my phone. Yeah. You know, I didn't know where the next uh, meal was coming from. Um, so that, that really, you know, opened my eyes. So, you know, I just love my daughter to be, uh, to be to be kind. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it feels like it's again, it's it's missing, isn't it? It, mm. it kindness gets lost, it gets overlooked, it gets covered by all the other stresses of of life. But it's there again, innately in all of us, this sense of wanting to do things for other people, and it doesn't take much either, no. does it? It's not always about and there'll be people listening who who can't build the orphanages, but it isn't about the all the big things. It's the day to day no. things as well, isn't it? A hundred percent. It's it's about being collective. You know, as as single unit, I can't do anything, but as a collective unit, I can do so much more. And that's what uh, I've used. I've used my my platform to to get as many people involved in my projects, and to get as many people involved in what I'm wanting to do. Uh, for them to become involved, um, I, I always said to uh, 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 when people donated to our page, it's not about the the money you give. Even if you give me one pound or ten pound, it doesn't matter. For you to be involved, and then for you to have updates of where your money's gone to, or, or what's happened, or how it's how it's helped, mm. uh, because because then you're more involved. And what I've noticed is, uh, you know, once I've got them people involved, they they naturally want to give more. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, when they see my stories about my my uh, the times that I've been to the orphanage and been with the kids and stuff like that, they'll say, "Oh, you know, how can we help?" Kind of thing. Mm. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's it's about education as well for me. You know, educating people of, of of what's out there in the world because you know we we live in a huge world and we're sort of in our own little cocoon, yeah. you know, balloon in the UK. You know, we're shielded from what's really out there. Um, and you know, you know, I I always encourage people to go out and explore the world because it's a huge world and there's so much to see, so many different cultures, the way people live, and uh, it's completely different to ours. And um, you know, to to better yourself as an individual, you you, you learn from these cultures, yeah. and you you take things from different cultures to make your life a better uh, a better place, really. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Talking of culture, then, mm -hmm. and going back to to running, you yeah. also ran the Manchester Marathon, and I understand you ran it fasted during yeah. Ramadan. That's right. Yeah. So, so basically, I wanted to uh, challenge myself uh, to do something a bit different. To uh, as my dad always used to say, you know, if you do something big, you know, expect big as well so you know i thought you know what if, if i can do because uh, my religion um, is a big part of my life mm -hmm. uh, so during ramadan i thought you know what i wanted to keep running i still wanted to do something and i could raise a lot of money during ramadan as well uh, so uh, that's what i did i thought you know what how hard can it be to to run a marathon whilst fasting but don't get me wrong you know i wouldn't recommend it to everybody you know i went through a, a, a very a very uh, strict process of my training where I'd, I'd, I'd do a lot of fasted runs and I had you know doctors and nutritionists and uh, coaches behind me who would, who would constantly you know, tell me you know do this do that do this uh, so you know I knew what I was doing I knew what I was getting myself into because it's, it's not great uh, to, to run a marathon without any food or water um, but 
you know, if you trained hard enough, like I did, uh, I think I was in training for about four months, and specifically for fasting, running as well. Mm. Um, so, you know, I was in, I was in this like shape of my life when I did Manchester, and you know, I, I didn't do a great time, but you know, I managed to complete it. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm glad you kind of said that in terms of just a bit of a health warning um, yeah. across this for, for everybody as well, is that, you know, your body's going through so much physiologically during yeah. a run. Um, and when I was running uh, the marathon, because um, it's interesting you ran fasted because I was tapping into a lot of data about myself in terms of I had a little sugar monitor, you could probably just see that All right, yeah. through there, um, in terms of kind of the fueling and making sure I was hydrated and that my mm. glucose levels from kind of my readings were, were staying at that level but of course you were running completely fasted and i think you're absolutely right you have to know your own body yeah. before you even think about doing that and that build up to that getting to know your own body knowing how you feel what your metabolism is like what yeah. you can and and can't experience in terms of the effect it has on you is is so so important so what did you learn from that what did you learn from the running fasted um to be honest i i I sort of underestimated the time where you fi when you finish the marathon, which I finished, I think, about two half two during the day. Mm. And I thought, you know yourself, when you finish the marathon, you're, you're buzzing. You know, you've yeah. got the vanilla, you're, you know, you're high-fiving everyone, hugging everybody. You know, at the end of the day, you know, you've uh, finished a marathon. Uh, you should be elated about it. But for me, on Manchester, when I finished, um, because I knew at the back of my head I still had six hours before I could eat or drink, and that time was tricky for me because, um, you know, normally I'd go to sleep and then sleep till uh, till we open our fast. But because I had, uh, I was buzzing so much, I couldn't go to sleep. Yeah. So I ended up just um, going out for a walk straight after the marathon and just try to kill time. And it, it's, it's, it's more of a, a mental barrier for me. And, you know, I really struggled at that time, them, them six hours. Uh, because the run itself was actually good, I, I, you know, I didn't feel dehydrated so much. I didn't feel hungry because mm -hmm. I'd, I'd trained for it, but I, I didn't really train for that bit yeah. where, where you're in no man's land almost. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, interesting. So do you have any tips for people who, not at marathon level, but who, who are wanting to run in a mm. fasting fasting state? I'm not talking about 26.2 miles, yeah. even, you know, a few kilometres, 5K, kind of a shorter run or a daily run. What are your, what are your tips for running fasted? Uh, to run fasted, all, um, it's, it's about doing, uh, getting your pace right. Uh, for me, um, you know, that is one thing I concentrated on is finding a pace that mm. suited me, that suited my body. And uh, to have the discipline to keep that pace as long as you can can go. Um, so, yeah, you know, it, you know, controlling your pace. And I I've done a lot of uh, I got involved with park run as well. Mm. It's only five kilometers, so um, I I do a lot of them uh, whilst fasting. And um, because you're in like a community and you're sort of talking like every time I do a park run now, I'm I'm literally talking from start to finish and by the time you finish, you, you don't even realise you've done 5k and that's what the marathon is almost like for me, you know, I, I talk a lot on the marathon, you know a anyone that's literally running by me I'll, I'll ask them, you know, why are you running kind of thing and I'll have a 5-10 to ten minute conversation and then I'll move on to somebody else and by that time, you know you, you know, you'd finish 26 miles, I mean, you, you won't even realise <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that. And and that was great, wasn't it? Just again hearing people's little mini stories as 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 you're running is is incredible. It was just it made it so much fun as well. Um so love 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 that. Tell us about Pride of Britain and yeah. why you won Pride of Britain and what that moment was like for you when you discovered that you were a Pride of Britain award winner. Yeah. So I was in complete shock. They proper did one over on me on that one. Even my wife did one over on me because um, uh, ITV, who who sought Pride of Britain out, they contacted her and said, listen, we want to give Iman the award for Pride of Britain for what he's, for what he's done and what he's accomplished. And so then my wife and Pride of Britain were in planning for, for a while. And they uh, when I arrived home, you know, I had all these cameras you know, at my house and um, I forgot I present present her name. She 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 gave me the Pride of Britain award, and they they sort of uh, took me through like everything that I've done over the last like ten fifteen years in terms of like uh, charity work and helping people. Um, and it sort of like brought a tear to my eye because it, you know I, I do things I, I do it and then I sort of almost forget about it 
kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? I sort of live for the moment. Um, so, you know, when Pride of Britain, like, they, they, they showed me everything that I've done, um, I was like, all right, okay. You know, it's it's great to be looking back at these kind of memories. Uh, but to be recognised in, in such a big honour uh, for me was overwhelming, you know, I was just like I said. I was just completely taken back by it, and then the actual award ceremony itself was was uh, another day. It was a spectacular day. You know, I got to meet so many of my role models, so many people that I've looked up to and seen them in in person, and for them to actually recognise me as well. Oh, you're Ebon, You're the you're the. And that was that was a, incredible. Uh, I remember we were sat next to Frank. I was sat next to Frank Bruno. And then he is here looking at me, and I didn't have the, the the bottle to go up to and ask him, "Can I get a picture?" <laughs> so he was there staring at me, and then I was like, "Why is he staring at me?" Oh, I've got some on my face or something. And then then he came, then he, he sort of like called me over. So I went over, and he goes, "Oh, you're that guy from the race across the world." And I was watching. I was like, "Yeah, that's right." He goes, and then he actually remember my, my name. And anyway, I got chatting to him, got a picture with him, Aww. and uh, you know, it, it, it's just that you know, Frank Bruno's always been my hero. <laughs> From uh, from from a young age, but yeah, there's so many different types of people, and it was great to meet other other people that have been nominated and that won Pride of Britain because they've done some amazing things, you know, in terms of like overcoming uh, diversity, you know, overcoming uh, disabilities and all different types. You know, I was in awe of them yeah. um, because you know. You know, people go above and beyond, um, you know, the call of duty to raise money awareness for different causes. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really matter which cause it is, but as long as it's something that's to your heart, something that you're passionate about, um, you know, it's it's all good. I, I remember on, in London Marathon uh, last year, they wanted me to speak on the main stage and they asked about fundraising. So I've done a lot of fundraising and they said, can you give me any tips? So... Um, my my only tip was to be to to know the reason you're running yeah. because that will give you the momentum to complete the 26.2 miles to, to come to, because uh, some of the targets are daunting you you have to raise two two and a half grand for certain tar uh, charities and they are daunting mm -hmm. but when you're passionate about something and when you know the charity and the work that they do it's uh, it, it makes a huge difference. Um, and that's for me. That's what I do. Every time I race for a different charity, I'll get I'll I'll get to know the charity. I'll do my own research mm. to find out you know what they're all about and what they're doing. And um, so that's my you know biggest uh, suggestion is to get to know you know why you're running, and the reason you're running, and that will make it so much easier. The oh, both yeah both from the fundraising and the day itself. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. I think that that reason why it just it comes up so much during the run, doesn't it? Yeah. it you know those moments when you you've got the pain and you're like, no, 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 I'm doing this for a reason, and I and that's going to keep me going. It's it's so so important. Did you did you cry at Pride of Britain? I've never watched Pride of Britain without crying. Yeah. Did you cry? Um, I, I'm, I'm not I'm not an emotional type of person to be quite honest with you, but uh, I did cry when uh, I actually found out. Then uh, that actually awards ceremony itself was all right, but when I found out when they came down to my house to to sort of surprise me, I was like, wow! And they showed me these clips of stuff that I've done, um, this stuff that I've you know not forgotten about, but they're in the back of my head and you know bringing back old memories and stuff like that. That that brought tears to my eye. Yeah, amazing! You have to champion yourself. You have to celebrate you because everybody else is emo, aren't they? So um, yeah. So important for you to do that as well. Talking about sort of health a little bit then as well. I mean, clearly running plays a, a big part for you in terms of your focus on on health. But is there are there other challenges when it comes to your health? Because sometimes we kind of zone in on the one thing and ignore lots of other parts of it. So do you feel there's things that you might be ignoring, putting on the sideline? Yes, um, you know, the health is such a massive topic, huge. Do you know what I mean? There's so many different types. Um, uh, for me, it was, you know, the reason I got into running was to lose a bit of weight and just to get back into shape. Uh, but then you sort of neglect what's actually going on in your head as well. And uh, at that stage, uh, I think I'm, you know, thousands of people going through the same process of just coming out of COVID, of, of the whole the mental state uh, that you're in, you know, being locked in your house day in, day out. Uh, I think that was key, um, and I, I don't think a lot of people address that so much as well uh, of the, the the mental effects you know COVID had on individuals, and uh, you know I'd 
I'd do some sessions at a, like a calling center, which my friend um, works at. So he asked me to come down. You, see, you just pick up the call, and people just start telling you their problems. Mm. Uh, and I found that you know amazing because you know because I always said you know you can talk about your mental health to like an individual, your your friends or family, but to talk to a complete stranger about your issues mm. of what's going on in your head is it's completely different um, because you know the stranger will not will not judge you they don't know who you are or yeah. they don't know what your problems are like um, so you know I'd recommend you know you know talking to people because um, you know a, a lot of guys my age you know uh, Asian guys you know in the 30s and 40s don't like to talk about these kind of issues mm. don't like to talk about like, issues that are affecting them on a day to day basis both family and personal they find they find it struggle to talk, but um, you know I found talking helps so much, and especially in uh, in my community, uh, you know British Bangladeshis between thirties and forties, a lot of these guys will talk to me uh, like on the phone and they'll break down in tears. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They they'll say, you know what, I've you, I've just got so much off my chest uh, because it's it's the best form of therapy is talking. Do you know what I mean? It's you know I, I can't say that enough and it, 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 it took me uh, to volunteer at this place to realize that mm. uh, so yeah I'd say you know mental health is is an area of health there where myself I don't really touch that because I think oh, there's nothing wrong with me but once mm. you start talking you realize you know what I do actually have a lot of baggage here and unloading this baggage just helps relieve so much you know weight of your shoulders mm. Mm. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. It's the the jumble and the constant thoughts that we have, and we have these all the time, all day long. And making sense of them comes by putting them out into yeah. into the space. And once you've been able to do that, there's a release that comes just from talking. And as the as the listener, it isn't always about telling people what to do next and 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 giving them advice. It's the listening bit. Listening, and yeah. Yourself is is so 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 important. So who do you talk to? Um, too much. I I, I talk to, I talk to my daughter a lot. She's one years old. She don't understand me, but <laughs> I do talk to her a lot. And um, I'll, I'll say my my wife because I've had that relationship because I've, I've known her for like twenty twenty odd years. She's mm -hmm. almost my you know she's my wife, but she's my best friend as well. And you know any things that I have you know you know I talk to her yeah. um, and about any issues to be honest with you and um yeah uh, friends and family as well you know they're always there a helping hand uh, but you know as i mentioned before talking to a stranger is is something else now i've done that before as well you know talking to a stranger mm. you know, that doesn't know you that doesn't know who you are is it, it's, it's 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 one of the things you you need to do it to experience it if you know what i mean it's like a, a marathon where somebody asked me what's it like finishing a you know marathon I was like, you know what? I can't actually put it into words. It's something that you need to do yourself, yeah. because you know, every for everybody, it's different. Do you know what I mean? And you know, as, as that's why I recommend you know, everyone to you know, to actually you know run a marathon, even a marathon, half marathon, or or ten k. Just that sense of uh, going across the finishing line. Yeah. It's it's something else. Oh, totally. And I really believe our our human minds, our human bodies, they're just capable of so much more than we give ourselves credit for that sort of self-talk which is no I can't do this no no and even as you said no I'm not a runner no I can't I can't I can't and we we stick with that but really you don't know until you do a bit like what you said at the beginning you know once you see you can't unsee but yeah. in order to to see you have to go and go and do the thing yeah. that you need need to do right so just uh, yeah absolutely you know don't set up set yourself these limited boundaries which come from your own perception of something you haven't even experienced yet mm. just go out and and experience that so uh yeah that's uh that's amazing amazing um and as you say the sort of talking side of it it's it's hidden isn't it but it's so people not talking people wanting to put on a brave face people yeah. feeling that they've got to journey along in life on their own but going right back to the beginning and what you said this idea of belonging yeah it's again that's part of being human and once we feel a sense of belonging because there's somebody who also says yeah me too you're, yeah, not, exactly. you're not alone in this it, it creates this connection and, and communication doesn't it which is which is so so important oh wonderful we could we could keep talking i guess one yeah. question then is what do you think i mean a bit touched on this a little bit but for the world to be happier to be healthier mm -hmm. what do you think needs to happen 
I think we all need to start talking more. Um, I think, um, you know, from a personal level, I think guys also need to start talking more because we bottle it in. Um, you know, since I found that sense of talking to people and, you know, getting my problems out there, I just feel, you know, like a different person. So, yeah, in a nutshell, I'd say, you know, open your mouth and start talking and, you know, we'll all become happier. Um, that'd be it. Simple. Yeah, no, 100%. And anyone who's listening thinking, I don't know who to talk to, oh. I'm here, connect with me, Eamon's there, yeah. connect with him, you know, just... <laughs> come and have a chat with us because we're just very open and as we say we we see the difference that that makes and and like you I see the difference that makes for me when I do it um, yeah. and 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 it's so important to to raise the profile of that as well and as you say you know particularly men uh, yeah. who who sometimes they use humor to get her out yeah. of talking about things exactly. um, or move on to the next topic very quickly and I think just giving people that space so if you're listening and you're thinking I don't know what I have to talk about but just talk then connect with us me Eamon Eamon what is the best way of reaching out to you if, if somebody does want to do that yeah so um, I'm on my social media Instagram Facebook and Twitter um, Instagram is, is my main thing I do um, lives like every two three days talking about different issues um, you know issues ranging from mental health to to normal health issues um, and yeah I invite people to come and join my lives as well you know uh, when, when people start watching me and when people request a live I'll, I'll always accept them and then you know we'll have a quick chat you know yeah. five whatever it is it helps so yeah, uh, Instagram and Facebook and all the social media channels, all uh, I'm there. Lovely, amazing, amazing. Love that, and that's such an easy way to to access you um, as well. I'll put your your link in the show notes as well, so people people can do that. I will be tuning in to your next live for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Eamon. It's been an absolute pleasure. Marathon runner to marathon runner speaking today. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. We are runners, okay? We've got to impregnate that. We are runners. <laughs> the question is, have you signed up for the year next year then? <laughs> well, do you know what? As I was running, I was thinking this is a little bit, and you may not be able to resonate quite with this, but it's a little bit like going into labor. Right. You you don't really know for the first time what to expect. And right. as you're going through it, you're thinking, never again, never again. And then the outcome of that pain yeah. is this incredibly beautiful gift. Yeah. And you want that again. You do, yeah. And you go on to have another child or even another child. So my simple answer to your question is, Yes, yeah. <laughs> I have signed up for, for round number two. So <laughs> watch this space. <laughs> yeah, watch this space indeed. Absolutely. Uh, have a wonderful, wonderful day. Such a pleasure speaking to you. Well, thank you. Good. Cheers. What a lovely conversation. What a wonderful human being. You could just see his warmth and his empathy shining through, couldn't you? And his humility. I mean, after running nine marathons, he still says he's not a runner. <laughs> so that's what I'll be talking about on next week's show, what being a runner means. So what I'll be talking about is the physiology of what happens when you run, together with some techniques for running, and also talking about fluids and fueling, about recovery and rehydration. And I'll also give you some medical considerations when it comes to running. So tune in next week, and I wish you a health-activating day. <laughs>